Hello, this is John Mount from Wind Vector LLC, a data science advising, consulting, and training company. What I'd like to talk about today is some very powerful techniques to use with Jupyter Lab or Jupyter Notebooks. Now, a lot of you know Jupyter Lab through Jupyter Notebooks, and it's a very heavyweight system that runs data science processes in a web browser. So essentially, usually a remote server is set up, and then one connects to that remote server, and then one can run notebooks, which are really a valuable thing to be able to do because notebooks go beyond mere literate programming in that they combine documentation, code, and results. They don't actually produce additional files. They contain everything in their own file. And uh, those results can include graphs and fairly complex artifacts. So here we have a very simple Jupyter Notebook. This cell is Markdown, so it's just formatted text. This cell is Python code. And this last cell is, again, Python code. And it's imitating the task of money be running a large analysis for a particular city. Um, and so we can do kernel, restart kernel, and run all cells. And the star means the cell is waiting for execution, and then the cells are done. So the technology or methodology, sorry, that I'd like to talk about is in GitHub at WinVector, WVPY. And it's a small package, also available on PyPy, for doing a lot of things with Jupyter Notebooks in production. Now there's a resistance to putting Jupyter in production as it's a GUI and it's heavyweight. So we're, all we're doing is using some of the Jupyter exposed APIs, putting a thin shim on them and making them a little more suitable for production. Our stereotype example is taking that worksheet we just showed you and running it for many cities. So the data analyst or data scientist would create that worksheet once maybe run for one example city, and then their data engineering or methodology team would take over that worksheet and put it into production where it can be run against very many cities. The example I'm going to show is again in GitHub WinVector WVPY examples, declare variables. And the uh, steps I'm going to take are all in this steps.bash text. But before we do that, I'm going to, um, again, open up that initial example notebook. But this time I'll do it using VS Code. So here I have VS Code, one of the many good IDEs. I tend to prefer an IDE versus using a remote web interface. And I have this initial example worksheet. I can clear all outputs, and run all the cells. Again, this delay is just the Python environment setting itself up. Reruns are much faster. And we've now done a huge analysis for uh, Los Angeles. Now, what we can do that's a little more production oriented is in the declare variables, we have the steps.bash. And what we can do is render the notebook all by ourselves. So we'll just clear out all these files, which are not there, which is great. And now we'll run this command. And what we're doing is we're saying Python, run a program for us. That program is inside the class or Python module path instead of being in the current directory. That's what the minus M. The program we want to run is WVPy render notebook. And we're saying apply that to our initial example.ipython notebook. So that notebook is in this directory. So what we've got is we've now run the Jupyter render pattern from the command line, which means it's something we could program over either through the command line or through Python, because this is a pure Python application. And what it's done is it's rendered as HTML this initial example .ipython notebook. So we can look at the results. And it's just like when we ran in Jupyter Lab, we see that the results are placed in here. And then any important side effects that a real data analysis might have, such as loading results into a database table or writing co comma separated value tables, could also have happened. 
So let's continue on with our example. And let's take a look at a slightly more sophisticated version of this example and what else to do. Again, everything we're going to do is in this steps file. The next thing we want to show is we can render a slightly different way. We can render with the strip input argument. And that's kind of a cute one. Let's go ahead and do that. And what, you, what that does is the resulting HTML now has most of the input cells and the cell labels stripped out. So this is a little closer to being able to build reports directly without all the code shown. So that's a nice feature I like to use a lot with my clients. So now what we're going to do is we're going to convert this notebook into something a little more compatible with automation and source control. So let's take a look at that. Move the results. Now let's take a look at what's, what a Jupyter Lab or a PyPython notebook is. It's actually a monstrously large piece of JSON. And it um, so it's very machine readable, but it's also very dangerous that it's not very compatible with source control because even opening it will often change some of the metadata, such as what version of Python it's running in. And if there's any um, large artifacts in it, like graphs or so on, they will be UU encoded and there'll be these huge, essentially machine-readable ASCII blocks. So um, we can see our code here, but the actual code is a minority of this structure. So to uh, not deal with that and not have that contaminate things like GitHub, a lot of people sort of have a no notebooks under source control. Now, an easy way to deal with that is we can convert this notebook into Python. Now, obviously, NB convert can do this. And in fact, this program is just a small shim on top of NB convert. So it says what it's doing, it's taking the IPython or JupyterLab notebook, converting it to Python, and it's, uh, there, um, it's also uh, copying the original to a backup. The minus delete means it deletes the original Python notebook so that there's not both a PY and an IPY NB present. But it, for safety, it puts it to a twiddle file or a backup file. Now, the great advantage of the Python file is it's just Python code. All the text blocks are put within these string constants, which are safe. And then there's the code. Here's a code cell and there's a code cell. Now, that means that this can be run just by saying Python file name, and um, we get results. And that just puts results out onto standard out, and any side effects such as loading results into a database would have presumably happened. So the idea is that once we have that converter, we can convert back also. And the convert back is actually just the same command because we carefully did not put the suffix. So let's go ahead and watch that run. And it says it's taking the py file, building an ipython notebook file, and it's backing up your py file as a twiddle because we said to delete the original. So now we have the notebook back. And it's a very good work pattern just to never check the notebooks in, check in only the uh, corresponding PY files. There's also a lot we can do with the PY files directly. As you saw, we can run them directly, or we can use a runner to run them. Now, the runner I like is this one. Again, a WVPY service. And uh, let's get the PY file back and see that work. So there we now have a PY file back. And let's take a look at the runner. So the runner is just like when we ran the Jupyter Lab notebook. And we're just, again, we elided the suffix so it can find whichever one's present. If it's ambiguous, it refuses to run. It runs it. And what it's done is it implicitly copies 
the Python file back to um, a JupyterLab notebook so we get a full HTML run from that effect. So that's kind of nice, but it still has some IPython or JupyterLab dependencies, which is what we'll address later. Or oh, sorry, now. Um, but once we have that, we have the ability to do a lot of things. And those things include running the file some way other than just directly calling Python. And the cities example we can do is um, we can have a runner be another Python file. And this Python file is designed to run a slightly different notebook. So we have our initial example um, notebook right now in Python form. And we have our declare example JupyterLab notebook, very similar. And what differs is, the only thing that differs is this block. Well, obviously also the import, which is importing and defining declare task variables. So this is a context manager with, and it says with access to our global variables, um, declare that the city is Los Angeles. And this does absolutely nothing new. In fact, we can just run it. And it runs just like the original um, initial example did. It, it does the analysis for Los Angeles. So what we can do that's new Sorry, clicked ahead. What we can do that's new is we can use a more sophisticated runner that overrides this value. And that's what I really wanted to show you. This is a big capability increase. So this is a very simple runner. It says we want to do the analysis for three cities, Los Angeles, San Francisco, Brisbane. We collect those cities into a task. Each one's running the exact same Jupyter Lab notebook, declare example.ipython notebook, which is right there. And it's saying, the sheet variables are city is the city named, one of Los Angeles, San Francisco, Brisbane, and the output suffix is under bar city. So we collect these tasks, and then we just render each one as HTML, um, which is just a method on the task, one at a time. And we can run that in the shell. And now we're going to see the value of this. So there's the run command. And one by one is rendering the sheets. And you see we have a result for Los Angeles. Um, a result for Los Angeles, a result for Brisbane, and a result for San Francisco. Close that all out. And that is where it becomes powerful. For clients of mine, we've run these on thousands of variations of the worksheet where we apply the same analysis principle to many, many cities and dates. So that ability to run in batch is a big, big deal. We can then extend that. So we can go from cities example 01 to cities example 02. And instead of the for loop over the tasks, we can just run it as a pool using Python's multiprocessing pool system, which is essentially a fork pool where services are moved from place to place. Let's go ahead and see that in action. Remove all the results. And let's go ahead and do the run. So we'll do cities example two. Now what it's doing this time is it issued all three starts in parallel and they all ended in parallel. And again, we have the San Francisco result, the Los Angeles result, and the Brisbane result. So that gives us parallelism, which we can do quite a lot with. We could run much, much faster because you know we have a lot of much more powerful machines than having just one CPU or one thread. And so here we do, see we use the notebook by its full name. There's one more level of excitement we can get to. We can change that suffix from IPython notebook to Python, which means that Python file has to be around. 
and we can set this additional option in the run pool called use Jupyter equals false. There's an ongoing bug or interaction between Jupyter and 0Q or 0MQ. And there's a basically a race condition and it starts and sometimes the Q port gets consumed and blocked. You can see about four years of issues on this on various issue trackers and Stack Overflow where people say they've seen the problem, the problem can be overridden by setting this feature, and that feature is now in the Jupyter base code. However, it's an intermittent transient problem because not a lot of people run Jupyter in production. So the idea is if we say the suffix is py and we say use Jupyter equals false into our run pool, so just a very small change from the city's example three, then we can run all these things without any actual dependence on a Jupyter queuing system. So let's go ahead and do that. Remove the results. And then we need the um, we need the declare example back into as a Python sheet. So we convert it back and then we'll do the run. So this one, as you see, you don't see all those spurious uh, warnings because we're not triggering the uh, Jupyter code path, which has some issues. And we um, did do a parallel execute. It's just they're so fast that they, it, the issuer doesn't really have time to say it or do it before they print. And this produces the following set of results, text files. One for San Francisco, one for Los Angeles, one for Brisbane. And again, if these systems had any side effects, such as doing a substantial analysis and writing results into a database, that would be happening. So at that point, you then have accomplished several things. You've been able to compute a Jupyter or IPython notebook to and from Python, which NB Convert can obviously do. This is a shim that does the two-way conversion quite nicely. On top of that, you can run Jupyter sheets either as Python text or as full Jupyter from either the command line or as a Python call and that can save the results into an external HTML. So we've separated presentation from implementation. You can also use the converter to make sure you never check Jupyter worksheets into your source control, which makes for much better differences in tracking of what you're doing. And you can run many of these using the parametric interface, and you can then also parallelize them. And we have to avoid a subtle transient issue with ZMQ, the ability to run without Jupyter at all. Now, the thing I'd like to end with is how that works. The, sorry, how the parameterization override works. And the idea is the, we had the declare example that we started with. Um, right now, here it is in IPython notebook. And what I said is, when you use this context manager with the with declare task variables block, you can declare variables and default values, and they can be overridden. An example of them being overridden is this sheet, declare examples two. All it does is the external runners that we've been using, the WVPY product, all it does is it inserts into the global variables a single map or dictionary called sheet variables. And then the sheet variables um, are used within this context block to override values. So this city would change the city from Los Angeles to San Francisco. And we can see that by running all the block. And you see it's a San Francisco analysis. And we can declare variables we don't override so we can use useful defaults. The next few examples are the edge cases of the error checking that this context manager does for us. The first obvious error is what if city had been defined before we got to the de declare block? And we've decided that that's confusing. That uh, that means the user has not clearly um, expressed that, that this is a variable to be overridden because it was preset here. And the way we deal with that is the code detects what variables were uniquely initially defined in the declare task context. And it says attempting to set pre with variable city. 
The other thing that can go wrong, which we again avoid for the user, is the incoming sheet fares, which again is automatically set by the task runner. We're just setting it here explicitly so we can see it, might set a variable that the user has no knowledge over, that they didn't consider um, a parameter of the analysis. And when we do that, it again errors out deliberately with you declared to an, you assigned to an undeclared variable state. And in the declare example IPython notebook, you know, we don't see that explicit sheet variables variable because that would be set by the runner before we even make it into this block. And the, um, so the nice thing about having these default assignments and values is the IDE you're using such as uh, Visual VS Code, it doesn't consider this city variable here as undefined because it has a definition. So the user would perhaps set a city they're interested in, or the analyst or data scientist, run a number of analyses and refinements, and then just convert this sheet to Python, share that with their production staff, ML engineers, ML ops, and then this could be run through one of the sheet runners in parallel with no Jupyter dependencies since if they've converted to Python format. And uh, it's uh, just using standard Python pool, which again is a fork or process level parallelism. So even though Python's not that friendly with thread level parallelism, this gives us very isolated task level parallelism. And if you're not experiencing any of the Jupyter problems, you could just not set this Jupyter, use Jupyter equals false, and then you'd get full HTML rendering using the Jupyter packages instead of this text rendering. And that's basically the capabilities of WVPY, and the examples are all in WVPY GitHub, uh, WinVector, WVPY GitHub, examples, declare variables, and every example we've done is here. Thank you very much for your time. Again, my name was John Mount, and I'm from WinVector LLC, a data science and machine learning, consulting, and training, and research company.